You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast. After several years of ideating and experimenting and having fun in a professional context, I decided to set up Affinity. So that was the start of it all. We provide deposits, savings, and investment products to our customers and loans as well, too, which is very important. That was what Affinity was created for. It was created to support them by providing them affordable and convenient services that they can trust. We sell our products uh, using an agency channel. It was all built with the majority in mind, which is what we're in effect doing. So a lot of institutions from the global north actually coming to Ghana to access our content, which is fantastic. Stay tuned as we bring you inspiring people who are unlocking Africa's economic potential. You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast with your host, Tessa Adamu. Welcome to the Unlocking Africa podcast, where we find inspirational people who are doing inspirational things to unlock Africa's economic potential. Today, we have Tarek Mugani, who is CEO and founder of Affinity Africa, which is a digital banking company that supports the unbanked and underserved by providing every individual and business with accessible and affordable financial services that they can trust. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the podcast, Tarek. How are you? Thank you, sir. I'm great. Very happy to be on here with you. Oh, it's great to have you on the podcast. I know we've had this conversation for a little while, so it's great that the day has arrived. Indeed, indeed. You know, it feels like months ago since we last spoke. Yes, it is. So I was hoping before we delve into the conversation, you could introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about Tarek Mugani. Absolutely. Thank you. It's always an awkward question when I get asked that, you know, (laughs) what are you, what do you do? What keeps you busy? Right. But um, I'll do the standard Ghanaian response. Uh, My name is Tarek Mgani. (laughs) I'm from Ghana, fourth generation, Um, grew up in Kumasi of all places. Um, It feels like such a long time ago. I'm old now. (laughs) And uh, uh, to a family of, I guess we trace back our origins to Lebanon. And I have a bit of a varied story. I left Ghana when I was 12, moved to the UK, studied in the UK. And about 10 years ago, um, it was my mom that inspired me to come back to Ghana. Um, She was almost complaining. My parents were both of them complaining, like, why are you coming back to your country to do something positive and useful instead of working in Europe? (laughs) So I took it as a threat, in fact, actually. So I, I quit my job and I moved back to Ghana about 10 years ago. And um, after several years of of ideating and experimenting and having fun in a professional context, I um, decided to set up Affinity. So that was the start of it all. And that's sort of, I guess, who I am. It's what I do is Affinity. And it's quite fun. Uh, I love what I do. It gives me a lot of joy, a lot of purpose as well, too. And it also kind of reminds me as to why I am here because of all the support that I've had basically my entire life. Um, And it's mostly through women. In fact, actually, Um, I was raised by my mom, obviously. Um, My dad went to work, but my mom raised me. (laughs) And then later on, when I moved to the UK, my grandmother raised me. And I I look back and I think through all the positive influences I've had my entire life and the support that I've had to be able to achieve what I have done in my life. It predominantly came from the people around me and, and women in particular. Awesome. Thank you for that, Tarek. So you've mentioned you're from Ghana, studied in the UK, moved back to Ghana to set up Affinity. So I was hoping you could give us a bit more detail regarding Affinity. What is it? What do you do? What are you hoping to achieve? Hmm. So we're a bank. I don't like calling myself a neobank. A digital bank is probably a better definition. We're a bank in the sense that we actually operate as a bank. So we provide deposits, savings, and um, investment products to our customers, and loans as well, too, which is very important. Um, There's a chronic issue in our part of the world. You know, when I moved back 10 years ago, My big vision was supporting entrepreneurs, and there are different types of entrepreneurs, as I define them. It's sort of almost in three categories. The first are the entrepreneurs that you and I think of as soon as, you know, someone mentions the word. I mean, you're an entrepreneur with this podcast. I'm an entrepreneur as well, too, with Affinity, and we're all entrepreneurs. We all have side gigs and hustles, as you know, in our part of the world. But there are two other categories. It's sports people. I would categorize as entrepreneurs as well, too. You know, they work very hard for prize money and eventually basically gigs and being sponsored. And then the third category is actually the creatives. So artists, musicians, which, you know, for the last few years have been really kind of flourishing in our part of the world as well, too. 
So as I mentioned, when I moved back to Ghana 10 years ago, I had my finger on a number of pies. I was a national athlete for Ghana. I raced for Ghana in triathlon. I decided to start the Ghana Triathlon Federation. It was really interesting because, you know, with sports, if you build it, they will come. You know, if you provide a race, you can inspire people to come and participate. Everyone was trying to ask, you know, what is a triathlon? You know, oh, you swim, you cycle, you run. That's so cool. When can I do one? I was like, well, we have one coming up in February. People signed up. It was quite hilarious. You know, I was there at two in the morning painting a, a finished sign because of wood that someone had donated to us that was all sort of like ridden in termites. It was awful. I looked like a smurf at the, when the sun came out, <laughs> painting it in blue. Uh, but 14 people turned up. It was quite cool. 13 Ghanaians, one non ghanaian and he turned up with a terrible bike and lost. <laughs> poor, poor guy. And someone from the Ghana Paralympic team joined as well, too. He, cyclist. He had one leg, and it was amazing watching him swim for the first time. Cycle, which obviously he did and kicked everyone's butt <laughs> and then ended up running basically on, on clutches, which was really quite extraordinary. That was the start of Ghana Triathlon. We grew, you know, we had 14 athletes the first time around. Five years in, we had 400 athletes. It was unbelievable. It was incredible if, if, if you look back at that story. But there was a progression after that. You know, we had amazing athletes in Ghana, but they grew very big, very quickly in a very small, not very deep field of athletes. We then got ratified by the International Triathlon Union and brought some international athletes from the continent to Ghana, it moved the bar. You know, our athletes were winning all the time, but there wasn't much competition. All of a sudden, you brought an athlete from South Africa or from North Africa in, and all of a sudden, they realized, holy smokes, we need to work harder for this. So then they pushed up their level as well, too. Then we started sending our athletes to the Commonwealth Games, to international races, and it even brought in the, the field as well. You know, there's always like a strategy, a development progress when things like that happen. It happens in the creative space as well, too. And of course, the third part, which was your question around affinity, is entrepreneurs as we define them. It's my passion. It's what I care about. It's what I really, really, really want to focus my life on. And Affinity was created to support these entrepreneurs that you and I know very well, that you and I interact with on a daily basis when we walk down the streets in Lagos or drive down a motorway in Accra, all these small and micro enterprises that, that we interact with. That was what Affinity was created for. It was created to support them by providing them affordable and convenient services that they can trust. Fantastic. So you've given us great insight into why and how Affinity started. Also emphasize that Affinity is a digital bank. So if we look at that aspect, how does Affinity leverage, say, fintech and innovative design-led solutions to improve financial access and affordability in Africa? It's a very good question. So we're a holistic, we're a full-fledged bank. So historically, what fintech has done in our part of the world, it's provided monolithic products. So for example, mobile money, which has been a game changer on our continent, is mostly around payments and remittances, which we provide. Obviously, we have full interoperability with mobile money. Um, you have some savings fintech platforms, which is great. And you have some lenders as well, too. What we've done is we've built a holistic, full-fledged, full-tech stack of a digital bank that provides everything. It would be, if you're in Europe, it would be what an HSBC or a Lloyds Bank in the UK or a Citibank in the US would do, or a retail bank. And that's very important. So by providing that entire range of products, we can diversify our revenue streams, improve our profitability, and as a result, be competitive when it comes to providing affordable products. So that's the first thing that's very important. It's not rocket science. It's a product that's existed in the global north. We've looked at that strategy and replicated it in the global south. How we do it is what's interesting, I think, um, which is sort of the question that you asked, Tercer, by leveraging fintech. We sometimes don't necessarily have to depend on very fancy new technologies. A lot of our customer base with their levels of literacy and their access to smartphones ends up not basically providing much use case there. We've leveraged established and old technologies that they're familiar with. USSC channels, for example, a user interface that's designed specifically for our customer demographic as well, too. It's very friendly. Even the naming conventions that we use, the, the way in which basically we sell our products uh, using an agency channel, it was all built with the majority in mind, which is what we're in effect doing. You mentioned in terms of fintech in Africa tends to provide monolithic products. So if we can go into more detail in terms of what specific products or services do you provide or offer to the unbanked in sub-Saharan Africa? So let's take a look at our user journey. So we use agents and we use apps, mobile apps as well too. So the first thing is we provide you with an account to onboard you onto our platform pretty instantly. 
In under two minutes, basically, you can open an account with us, which is a huge game changer. Once you have an account with us, that's basically your current account. We don't charge any fees. We're 90% cheaper on transactions than our closest comparables. And we provide interest on that account as well, too, which is obviously a huge, a huge deal um, because most current accounts don't have interest on them. That's the entry level for every single one of our customers. On top of that, the other products we provide are savings accounts that have higher interest rates and investment accounts that also have higher interest rates. And then finally, we provide lending products to them as well, too. So once you open an account with us and you save and you have a history of at least three months, we, we can extend a line of credit to you. And it's roughly about 50% cheaper than digital lenders, traditional digital lenders. All that is on a platform that has full interoperability with other bank accounts. So you can move money in and out as well as mobile money as well, too. Fantastic. As you are aiming to bank the unbanked, would you say this issue within Africa is more of an access or a literacy issue that needs to be overcome? It's actually everything. I would say affordability is very important. So a lot of the times, my colleague has a great story, as do I. A lot of the times when it comes to traditional financial services, I remember doing some work around, I was mystery shopping back in the day when I was looking at how the banks operated. And I remember a woman coming in from the market outside a pretty well-established bank and she left her shoes outside the door and yes. walked in basically because, you know, she just felt othered, obviously. So I think accessibility is very important as well, too, and affordability, too. So accessibility is their ability to fulfill KYC requirements to open a bank account, which obviously mobile money has done a very good job at, and we leverage that. The second thing is affordability, and that comes in two forms, Terser. First, it's not just the fees and the interest. Secondly, it's the time consumption. So that woman I gave you an example of, you know, she could be a sole proprietor. She's in a shipping container in a very busy area making a decent amount of money. Every time she decides she wants to deal with a financial institution and she walks out her door, revenue goes to zero. And that's very important. So giving them access and going to them, to your customers is something that's also very important. And on top of that as well to affordability and affordability comes in two forms, not just the pricing, but also the opportunity cost as well. In terms of how we give these products to the customers on the literacy side, we it's very hard to think through, um, unless you have a very, very strong product, which obviously we do, it's very hard for you to sort of like have a classroom-based literacy level where you explain to them what interest rate is, et cetera. It's actually, we leverage our, our agency network to do that, to explain how our products are affordable. And then secondly, it's the interface that we provide that are very user-friendly. So the, the customer journey itself. So if you look at a USSD channel, ours compared to our closest peer is about 20% shorter. It's also dynamic and the response rate is very instant, unlike a lot of other platforms. But we're using a language that our customer demographic is very familiar with. Fantastic. So you've touched on accessibility, affordability, and also how you overcome some of the financial literacy challenges to bank the unbanked. So when people are onboarded, access your services, I'm assuming you have some success stories or examples of how this ability to be banked has positively impact individuals and businesses' lives. Do you mind sharing one or two of those? Yes, um, absolutely. I mean, I used to be in the early days whilst we were designing all our tech. Um, I don't do it so much anymore now. I have an amazing CEO in Ghana that runs the business uh, uh, now. Now, yeah, and as we're looking to expand internationally. But I remember in the earlier days when the tech team and I were walking around trying to design our products, um, I met this amazing woman. Her name is Lizzie. And um, she was selling plantain chips on the side of the road. And there was a gentleman that sat behind her. I still don't know if it's her husband, her brother, or, you know, her someone. Anyway. She would sit dealing with the with the customers, obviously, you know, transacting, collecting cash. And he would sit there with a hand mandolin and slice plantains into a deep fryer. They would bag it up and sell these big bags to retailers as a wholesale uh, product. She started saving with us and she ended up basically borrowing, start off with small amounts so she could buy more stock. On the back of that, she started, you know, obviously generating more revenue because she had someone financing her stock and her supplies. She mm -hmm. wasn't relying just on her cash flow. We then started experimenting with a new product, which is growth capital. So these are longer term, shorter interest rate loans where people, it's not just necessarily working capital, but women like her are able to invest in their business to grow it. Um, the first growth capital loan she took from us, she put three walls behind the wall that she was at, put a roof on top of it and bought an air conditioning unit. 
not for her, but because she was buying a lot of plantains, she wanted somewhere to keep them cool so she could actually buy more at a cheaper price and improve her margin. So that was the first thing. It was really interesting. Um, so that's that's sort of the first asset financing that we helped her with. Then after that, as, as she continued to borrow and grow with us, she ended up buying equipment um, that would automatically slice these chips for her. And it's pretty awesome. Um, she went from being two in this in this team that she built. She's 14 people now, which is incredible. Um, and I went relatively recently to, to say hello to her. And she handed me a business card and it said Lizzie CEO on it. Wow. <laughs> I know I was so I took a photo of it on what's happened to you later, but <laughs> I was I was so happy. I had such a big smile on my face, but um, it's an incredible success story. And she went from generating about three hundred dollars a week of sales, I believe, to about I, think, I can't remember off of my head. Uh, please forgive me. I think it's about eight hundred dollars a week now, thanks to us and to the um, affordable loans we we're providing to her. And we have so many of these stories that we can uh, showcase and talk about. It's pretty amazing. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that amazing story. So we've looked at how Affinity has provided solutions to challenges that your customers have faced. So if you look at it from a different perspective in terms of some of the challenges that Affinity has faced while operating in sub-Saharan Africa, what have been some of the main challenges that you've faced whilst setting up or just in general operating? Well, tons, uh, as you can imagine, you know, being an entrepreneur anywhere in the world is not easy, let alone in our part of the world where there is a lot, there's a lot of uh, um, uncertainty and uh, being resilient is quite important. See, so you, you must really need to care about the problem in order for you to want to fix it for obvious reasons. Um, I think I kind of break it down into a number of factors. First is regulation. You know, uh, we're in a regulated environment and you've heard the stories, you know, regulators can be quite draconian sometimes. We're lucky that in Ghana, they're not. They're very strict, but it takes time and patience. So whichever partners you bring on board, if it's investors or if it's, you know, uh, team members, they need to really want to solve this problem in order for you to like walk on this path together. And we've been very lucky with that. The second is the macro environment. Um, so, you know, the whole world's a bit in flux at the moment. Our economies are less resilient and more vulnerable to extra shocks. And Ghana is going through a particularly difficult time. So that's also a major challenge. But in like full honesty, it actually fuels us as a business. Because in order for us to write a different story for our countries and our continent, what's very important is to support economic and social growth. And the biggest drivers of those uh, two categories are SMEs. You know, SMEs are the taxpayers of the global north, you know, 50% of revenue. They are the employers. They are the educators. And unless we build a strong middle class in our part of the world, we will forever have vulnerable and non-resilient economies. I agree 100%. So if we look past, say, the challenges that you've mentioned, such as regulators, uh, look at some of the positives, what would you say are some of the key milestones or achievements Affinity has reached since its establishment? So it's been such a long journey. So I mentioned to you, I moved back to Ghana 10 years ago, April 2013. Um, I actually set up Affinity as a consultancy firm back then. And I was consulting. So I was working for private equity funds who were looking to make investments on the continent. Uh, big consultant for an industrial park. I did a, a lot of investing out of my own pocket. And then in 2016, decided to set up a bank. We didn't actually start operations until 2018. We bought a microfinance business. So that was the first sort of key milestone. It took about a year and a half, almost two years, actually, to get approved by the regulator for that acquisition. So that was quite important to us. That's when we had something to play around with because you have to be licensed in order for you to actually do any work in financial services. That's when we all sat around. We started like, you know, lending. We started like speaking to customers, designing products. That was quite a lot of fun. That was when the fun began. Um, then in 2019, our tech team joined, which was incredible. So they've been with us for a while. And I'm very, very proud of the team and the work that they do. And, and they're incredibly loyal and have been with us for a while. So that's pretty amazing. In 2020, um, we applied to upgrade our license. We had raised um, some funding and applied to upgrade our license to get our banking license. Uh, the central bank received the application and then lockdown started. And for about a year and a half, we heard nothing back from them because, you know, they were trying to maneuver um, COVID. It was also a very proud moment. At that point, we'd given out about $9 million worth of loans. And uh, we lost a minimal amount, despite the fact that a lot of our borrowers were told to shut down their businesses. We're very lucky and it, it helped build into our resilience. Anyway, 
In the middle of 2021, um, we got our provisional license. And then in March 2022, we got our final license, which was the first that was granted in Ghana of its category in almost 10 years. So that was a huge milestone for us. I thought that was going to be the easy part, by the way, or the hard part, but no, absolutely not. It's been sort of moving at breakneck speed since, you know, we wound down the Mike Finance business. We started operating as Affinity for the first time last year. At the end of, of October, we launched our agency platform and um, we started acquiring customers. So about 4,000 customers were ported over from, um, from our microfinance business. And now in the space of eight months, we have 25,000 accounts with no marketing spend. It's been really, really amazing. We started lending about nine months ago and our NPL as well to 0%. So all the learnings that we picked up from um, running a microfinance business, from trying to understand how our customers interact with financial services and technology, we lifted and leveraged all of that with the team that's been with us for so many years and built products that basically resonate quite well with our customers. And it's working. The last eight months have been pretty amazing. Thank you for sharing those impressive milestones. So, I'm assuming to achieve these milestones requires a lot of collaboration and partnerships. I was wondering, how do you collaborate with, say, local governments and regulatory bodies to foster, say, financial inclusion and support the growth of the SMEs that you're working with? So I think we don't do anything formally yet. Um, we want to in the future as we grow. You know, we're still, I, I don't know if you've, you've seen the cartoon Bambi, but you know, when, <laughs> when you know, you're at the beginning when it's standing up and it starts falling through. I mean, we're now standing, but we're not at that point where we're sprinting yet. So on the initial stages, in order for us to actually get our license, it was very important that we collaborated with the regulator to explain to them what we were doing, why it was important, uh, specifically for Ghana and under the strategy of the government of Ghana as well, too. That was sort of the foundation that we laid down to actually start collaborating with them. Once that happened and we got the license, the product approvals have been pretty quick since, and we've been very, very lucky about that. I think once everything's in the market and we we have maybe a few more months of traction, I'm in particular interested in moving into the space where we start looking at policy and how we can actually support this segment of the market. And for that, working with regulators and working with government, as well as foundations, NGOs, and nonprofits who care about this problem, um, that for me is sort of the third phase of our growth as a business and one that I'm very excited about. Awesome. So you've detailed there that you're planning to foster these relationships in the medium to short term once you have that traction and growth so i've seen that affinity plans to scale its operations and expand its reach to impact the lives of 400,000 individuals by 2024 I mean, if we can do more than that, absolutely. Yeah. You know, we're, we're closing a fundraise at the moment, uh, which is great. And that's all going to fuel growth. The opportunity in Ghana on its own is about $9 billion. It's massive. On the entire continent, and well, sub-Saharan Africa, ex-South Africa, so not the entire continent, it's about $330 billion. You know, we're not going after a segment of the market that it's winner takes all. Um, we're focusing on a high margin part of the market where it's only about 40% penetrated. And it's very important that we collaborate with others. It's very important that we look at new territories to expand into. But the first step, as I mentioned, is doubling down on Ghana. It's where we're all from, where the team is from. It's where we've sort of bedded down our roots. Once that's established, the idea is to then start expanding outside of Ghana too. And just to compare those numbers, I know, Teresa, you mentioned 400,000. There are 11 million adults in Ghana without a bank account. Wow. Wow. So even 400,000 is hardly a decent percentage of that. Yeah. It could be much more than that for us. Okay, so you've touched in terms of part of your expansion plan is to expand it to new markets once you've kind of delved deeper within the Ghanaian market because there's a huge opportunity there. So looking at new markets, do you have any in mind in terms of ones that you'll ultimately be looking first at to expand into? Um, it's, it's, I don't have the luxury yet of thinking through like that, uh, since there's so much left to do in Ghana. But in terms of the framework that we'd be following, maybe that might be useful. So first and foremost, demographics, yes. I think it's important, you know, uh, going into a country where it makes economic sense. Um, secondly, trying to understand not just, you know, the size of the population, the unbanked segment of the market, but also their relationship with financial services. You know, having access to mobile money has actually helped us because we're a very complementary product to that as well, too. Um, and then the other two are certainly around regulation. You know, does the regulation allow us to operate as affinity in that country? You know, there's some countries that don't allow digital banking. 
we're very risk averse, I would say, when it comes to regulation. You know, we work very much in line with the regulator and respect it because that's how you end up growing in the long term and succeeding in the long term. And then the fourth part is market entry. You know, is it a greenfield license? Do you want to be licensed? Could it be a software play or are you going in by acquiring a bank like we did in Ghana? You did mention earlier to expand into new markets requires capital and you're in the process of raising investment to enable this. So for the founders listening, what is the process like trying to raise capital? Awful. I'm joking. (laughs) (laughs) You you know, I would say it was awful in the earlier stages because, you know, you just, I mean, it's like applying for jobs. You just hear no, 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 no all the time or dating, I guess, as well, too. You just hear no, no, no all the time. But eventually you find people that understand what you want to do. Well, actually, two things. Eventually you find out that what you're doing is a silly idea. Obviously not in my case because I kept on going because people couldn't question basically the business model that we were building. So that kind of fuels you to keep going. But eventually I found my tribe, which is the term I find myself saying over and over and over again. Because initially you think, I'll just take the money. Whoever can give it to me, I'll take the money. What's very important to make sure that whoever is joining you on the journey understands what you do. Because otherwise it could be a huge detriment to yourself. So it's funny now, we're closing off a fundraise now. We're about 80% done. Uh, It'll be announced in the next kind of couple of months. And it's funny because we're turning away money that in effect, maybe you don't, don't sort of share our values. And I have a list of questions that I ask. And depending on the response, basically from that potential investor, you kind of decide whether or not you want them to be with you on that journey, or if you're going to make your life harder when you're trying to solve this problem. So I think just trying to understand who you are as a founder, what you stand for, um, trying to understand as well to what you want to achieve in the short, medium and long term, and then finding the right partners for that. And those partners, those stakeholders are, aren't just your investors. They're your teammates, they're your directors, you know, they're your customers as well, too. It's about listening, understanding what you stand for and believe in and trying to convince others to come with you on that journey. And that's very important. Fantastic. So you've kind of touched on this in terms of when looking for investors, it's not just about the capital that is provided. What additional or added value do you look for in investors outside of capital? It's a very good question. Um, their networks, because they can also help bring on other investors on board. Their tech spec as well, too. We have an investor that that we actually have three investors that have been very useful in introducing us basically to CTOs from other parts of the world. So as we think through how to solve certain issues and problems, we've gotten advice from pretty well-established CTOs in other parts of the world and part of their portfolio that we've been able to speak to. So they can bring in some very good networks that way. But in all honesty, Tercer, sometimes you just want patient capital. Yes. People who will write a check and say, we understand that you know this is going to be tough and difficult. Here's a check, figure it out and report back to us in a year and, and let us know how we're at, where we're at and where to go to next. I think it's also about understanding the timing in the earlier stages. Um, when we bought this microfinance business in Ghana, I sold my house. I put my own money in. So that helped. I spoke to my former bosses who trusted me. They gave me capital as well, too. And they were very, very um, patient about it. And um, it helped us. It gave us space to, over over time, kind of play around with the microfinance institution and understand our customers very well. Without any of that, if we had the pressure, you know, to like launch in six months, we would have failed as Affinity frankly. And the reason why we're seeing the success now, the reason why we're seeing all these inflows and account opening all by word of mouth with no marketing is because of those stages of our development and growth. Fantastic. So you've shared some great insight during this conversation in terms of the challenges you've overcome, the milestones that you've hit and the process of raising capital. So I guess with all that in mind, what would you say are the biggest lessons that you have learned as a founder and CEO of Affinity? Wow. Um, That's such a tough question because I feel like I'm learning things on a daily basis. And um, I think really define your values. I was speaking to a friend of mine who actually a mentor of mine, believe it or not, even though I was I end up giving him advice. Um, He's at a part of his life now where he's at an inflection point and wants to figure out what to do. Um, I said it's really interesting because after I left, I worked for one of the largest hedge funds in the world. And after I left, I got so many job offers. It was quite overwhelming, but also it would have been very easy to have said yes. Um, I had to step back and not panic and actually define and put a framework together in terms of what I wanted with my life. What was my purpose? It was a very shameless list. I can't, I haven't shared it with anyone because I had to be very open to myself in terms of what did I want from the job? 
and what did I want the perception of what I did to be? And it was really a, a few months of very deep reflection. And it's sort of my tarot Bible is what I call it. You know, <laughs> I am now whenever a decision pops up or a new product that we're launching, or I get asked to support a certain project, I look at that list and I say, does this fit in with what I want and what I need? And as a result, in what I'm good at, which is very important. The second lesson I would say is you can't go at this alone. Um, it was very important in the early stages to understand what I stood for. Now it's very important to understand that other people need to help me on this journey. And I'm talking mostly my team. They need to understand what problem we're solving for. Very important. They need to care about it. Very, very important as well, too. And thirdly, they need to obviously be competent at it as well, which is, uh, believe it or not, an easier thing than the first two. Um, and that's also very important because I can't do everything on my own. It's impossible. And even though there were certain things that I was good at that I was doing, what I realized over time is it was draining me and my energy. And as one of my mentors, my other mentor said, she told me it's not technically your strength, even though you're good at it, because it takes energy away from you. So having to hire around those sort of roles and elements and bring on people on board and not feel precious about this child that you've created, but to realize, no, it's no longer a baby like, you know, Bambi was now it's walking. And then eventually it's going to be sprinting as well, too. It's very important to understand that. Amazing, amazing. So you've detailed, uh, obviously, this is a journey. It's an ongoing process and you're always learning. So if we go back and look at the core activities of what you do as Affinity and how the environment that you operate affects it, in your opinion, what do you believe are the key factors or some of the processes necessary to create a better standard for banking in Africa, particularly in underserved regions? I think there needs to be a lot of collaboration. That's very important. So that's the first thing. But it's also about defining what success looks like in terms of banking. So for me, it's obviously making sure that it's not just people like you and I, Tercer, that when we go back to our countries that we have access to financial services. No. It's about making sure that everyone has the ability to get a bank account. And in order for that to happen, it's not just about creating a bank, but also understanding what ecosystem setups need to look like in order for banks to succeed. I'll give you a simple example. Amazon cannot exist in Ghana, not because, you know, there's no demand for it. There is, I can tell you that. But Amazon isn't just an app. It's a warehousing setup, which depends on electricity, <laughs> on delivery systems and addresses. It depends on good roads. It depends on so many things that we lack as infrastructure in, in our part of the world. So in order for banking to succeed, policy needs to be set up properly, um, not just on the regulatory side, but across the board. In order for us to onboard uh, business customers, if I'm in the UK, I can open an account instantly online because I have API checks basically with all the regulatory bodies. I can check every single uh, business, who the directors are, and I can verify all that. We can't do that in Ghana. You know, it's a manual process and all these things create hindrances and the people it impacts the most are actually the majority, not the people who are privileged at the top like you and I. So it needs to be collaborative. It needs to be a huge effort. It needs to be led by some strong leadership and it needs to be tackled across every single pillar, not just banking or policy, but infrastructure as well to energy access to data as well. I mean, data is so expensive in our part of the world. You know, how can a digital bank operate if data is so expensive? All these things are very important. I agree. I agree. So you've detailed what needs to happen going forward to create a better standard for banking in Africa and I assume creating positive trends going forward. So keeping on the theme of trends, are you seeing any positive trends that you're excited about in your space in terms of digital banking in Africa? Absolutely. Every single day. It's super cool. <laughs> um, the fact that there are lots of fintechs that are popping up, this isn't a winner takes all problem. You know, if, if you're in Europe and banking penetration is 98%, it's a different thing. But at 40% on our continent, absolutely, uh, it's important that other players exist. That's that's something that's very important. Secondly, it's wonderful that fintechs are popping up left, right and center. You know, if I, we're setting up a digital bank in, in the UK, there are ID verification platforms I can use that are fintechs, etc. There are less of those basically in our part of the world. I'm very optimistic in terms of the direction that it, we're going in. I'm, I'm hoping that people come together a little bit more. And I'm hoping that there's more competition and more opportunities and very importantly, more investors willing to support startups as well, too, because the opportunity is massive. 
I, I just as an aside, earlier today, one of my investors introduced me to uh, Ugandan uh, fintech. They're interested in coming into Ghana and they're exploring whether or not they could partner with us, basically. And we would power their platform for them um, and, and support them. And then in this case, basically, you know, we both eat. <laughs> and it's very important that things like this happen. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that. So if we move from positive trends to the future, the future of Africa, I know this is a very open question. Where do you see Africa in the next five years with regards to digital banking? Um, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier on about me supporting creatives and also uh, athletes. Um, one of the biggest experts that we've had certainly in Ghana is our art. Um, we've, there has been a huge drive, as I'm sure you know, of like, you know, wonderful portraiture art, a lot of contemporary African art as well, too, which is incredible. So a lot of institutions from the global north actually coming to Ghana to access our content, which is fantastic. So I remember in the olden days, like 10 years ago, it used to be called African art. And now we're sort of in the stratosphere of art in general as well, too, which is incredible. What I would love to see in the space of fintech and digital banking is we end up basically competing and and being comparables, basically, at a level that is equal to the rest of the world. Because it's no longer about an African digital bank, it's about a digital bank. And I'll give you an example that really excited me when MFS bought uh, GTP. That really was such a huge win. The fact that an African fintech player, a very respected one as well too, but a US fintech, in order to actually roll out their products in our continent, I thought that was a very exciting move. And I remember everyone in the office was sort of cheering when we heard that news. And I'd like to see more of that happening where we export our talent and our expertise to the rest of the world. I hope so too. So if we look closer to home, where do you see yourself and Affinity in five years time? Hopefully in a few countries, um, hopefully with millions of customers where we've had a ton of impact and hopefully on the grassroots level stories like the story of Lizzie that I told you earlier on, because that's what keeps us going as a team and as a business. When the times are tough and they're often tough as a startup that's operating in Africa, that's in a regulated space and a very difficult macro global macro environment, the things that get you out of bed on a daily basis is the impact that you're having towards your customers. Quote of the week. As people, we often have quotes, mantras, proverbs or affirmations that keep us going when times are challenging or when times are good. Do you have one that you can share with us today? (laughs) I have a new one that someone taught me, another mentor, gosh, I have so many of them, that someone taught me (laughs) last year as I was was panicking because, you know, as a founder, you never stop to celebrate your milestones. You just think to yourself, gosh, there's so much more that's left to do. Because, you know, I know where I want to be in five years time and that's not where I am today. And in five years time, it's not where I'm going to want to be in five years after that as well, too. I remember this incredible woman sat me down. She said, breathe and trust the process. So I have that sort of embedded in my head now. Trust the process. And I keep on repeating it over and over and over again. Brilliant. I might just put that on my wall. Please do. (laughs) (laughs) So as we've come to the end of today's conversation, it's been a fantastic conversation one that i thoroughly enjoyed i was wondering do you have any closing remarks final course of action for people who are interested in affinity or just interested in digital banking in africa sure i mean always happy to share our story but more importantly in terms of a call to action to collaborate as well too if there's anyone out there that thinks that they can support us or we can support them please reach out and then the final thing i wanted to say to us is thank you for what you do as well too and telling stories from our continent And telling stories from entrepreneurs that are having an impact on the content as well, too. It's a very lonely journey, being a founder and being an entrepreneur. I have comfort in meeting other founders and entrepreneurs. But sharing your story, it it really takes quite a bit of that heaviness away. And thank you for what you do with your podcast. Fantastic. Thank you, Tarek. That has been an awesome conversation. You've created an exciting company and products which have potential of being game changers on the continent. So looking forward to seeing how things develop and the massive impact that you'll make. So thank you for joining me today on the podcast. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tristan. Okay, we will speak soon. Take care. Thank you to everyone who has listened and stayed tuned to the podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, share or tell a friend about it. You can also rate review us in Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast. Thank you and see you next week for the Unlocking Africa podcast.